we can continue again. Um, yes, so, step two, you know what you want to change in order to make the world a better place. And then the question is, so, how do we go about changing this? How do we change parts of people's psyche? Or, more specifically, subdeterminants, or as you call them in intervention mapping, if you select them for intervention, change objectives. Because, of course, then they become the objectives that need to change, or the objectives you have regarding change. Um, as I said earlier, one of the reasons why this is complicated is because if we look at the so-called natural kinds, like the things that arguably exist in the natural world regardless of how we view them, we end up with brain cells or neurons, and we have a lot of those, and we know that they basically eventually determine behavior. But this is not a useful venue to think about people's psyche or how to change it. But in this, there is also the solution. And the solution is that you now have fewer connections between these cells than you did five years ago. And that's not only because of alcohol and drug use, and it might also be because of alcohol and drug use, but it can also be, or it, it is certainly, because you learned. Because that's actually how organisms learn. They basically retain connections that are useful, beneficial in some reason, and other random connections between neurons that are not used, that are not useful, are just, well, disconnected. They die off, basically. So as you get older, people tend to become better at the stuff they do. They learn a lot how to do those things more efficiently, more automatically. But they also become less flexible. They become a bit more rigid. Because everything, well, it's called crystallized intelligence. Everything crystallizes out more and more. So the learning is how you can change parts of people's psyche. So the question is, how do you use this for an intervention? And these learning processes evolved over time. Because, of course, it's not the case that as soon as life existed, those first life forms were capable of learning. This just was created or created. This evolved over time. And the first thing that was apparently uh, useful to evolve in terms of learning was habituation. And habituation is the ability to ignore stuff that doesn't matter. So if you think about early organisms, that's basically everything that couldn't eat you, that um, you couldn't eat, and that you couldn't procreate with, are generally safe to ignore. If it's not dangerous and you can't eat it or procreate with it, then you might as well ignore it. Habituation is also why people are able to live next to a train station or close to an airport, because after a while you just don't process those sounds anymore. And then soon after, sensitization evolved, which is kind of like the opposite. You may not experience that you uh, touch a flame or something, you burn yourself, and then right after that, um, heat sources feel warmer when they are close to your hand. So it's like the opposite of habituation. It's not the case that signals are kind of ignored or drowned out. It's that some signals are temporarily more intensive. Then we have classical conditioning. You probably know the story of Pavlov, who went into his lab, and then he noticed that the dog started drooling. And dogs don't normally drool when somebody enters a room. Um, but the first thing he always did when he entered his lab was feed the dogs. And then he realized, aha, the dog learns to recognize that when they hear my footsteps, they will get food. So the response that's normally the response to food already occurs when they hear the footsteps. So they basically associated this um, response to other stimuli than the actual food, than the stimulus that normally produced the response. And then he started doing more systematic research with this. So that's what we call classical conditioning. Similar to how uh, people who use a lot of substances and they become dependent, they can experience craving, for example, in response to certain cues. So smokers might experience a stronger craving when they see an ashtray, because their body knows that generally an ashtray will be followed by a cigarette. Operant conditioning is kind of the same. It's also um, associating things to each other, but then associating things to your behavior. So it's not associations about what happens in the world outside you. That's classical conditioning. Operant conditioning is associations with if you do something, then it has a certain consequence. And this is used a lot by uh, people with pets or children, because that's generally how you 
train pets and or children to do something more or less. Then affective learning, basically emotions, are apparently, as we found out when we dove into this, uh, a generalization of conditioning. Conditioning is always tied to specific stimuli. But affective learning allows you to, for example, if you're in a new city and you see an alleyway that looks kind of dark and shady, then you'll feel hesitant to go in there. You'll feel a bit unsafe if you'd go in there, even though it's a new city and you've never seen it anyway, so you have no information about it. But you generalized over stimuli to create a kind of more abstract representation. And you're like, okay, maybe this is a bad idea. Then procedural memory, that's like, well, procedural memory is like riding a bicycle. Procedural memory is like um, connecting motor programs together into more sophisticated motor programs. Um, a famous example is tying your shoelaces. Apparently that's almost impossible to do if you actually think about the act you have to take before you do it. If you do it automatically, you just tie your shoelaces, it just goes. But if you stop to think every time what, what you should do exactly, apparently it's very hard. Because you created a motor program in your procedural memory. Then, cognitive maps are, well, pretty much what it says on the tin. They're maps of the world that you store in your memory. And this is how, for example, if somebody would now ask you how to get to the mass, even though you may have never gone to the, gone to the mass yourself from here exactly, you can still explain it to them because you have a cognitive map and you are able to kind of pinpoint the route. And this is not only humans can do this. They did studies with bees, for example, that they apparently released them somewhere they'd never been before in an area that they are roughly familiar with and then they can apparently fly to, I don't know, the shop or wherever they need to go quite directly. Then, after this, vicarious learning evolved. And this one is really important because we use it a lot in behavior change intervention. And because it's so important, I created a short movie to illustrate it. It's not as fancy as the movies I showed earlier, because I can't create movies. Also, because I did it in PowerPoint, which means it's a pain in the ass. So it's also very brief. But it is it, because this is so important, um, I thought it was worthwhile. So pay attention, because it's like 10 seconds or so. Dead. Which is... Sad for Barney, but good for us, because this allows me to illustrate that now Fred Flintstone, okay, maybe not Fred Flintstone because he wasn't like the brightest tool in the shed, but generally observing organisms uh, realize that they shouldn't go into that bush. This might seem kind of trivial, but this is the first learning process that evolved that didn't require the organism itself to experience something to trial and error. So this vicarious learning so vicariously means kind of through others. So learning through observing others' behaviors was super powerful. That's basically how we learn most things. We don't do everything through trial and error ourselves. We can also talk to each other and observe things and read books and stuff. And of course, we don't copy every behavior we see. So this is a good um, example of how actually these learning processes are quite Selective, they evolved in specific ways. For example, if you have, um, uh, I don't know, a horse, and the horse is really hungry, and then it sees a bird, and there happens to be an abyss close by, and the bird flies to the bottom of the abyss to eat some berries there, then the horse will generally not jump into the abyss to also get those berries. It only copies behavior of other organisms that are similar to it. Similarly, if you want to use vicarious learning in an intervention, we call it modeling then, it's important that your target population identifies with the model. That's why for modeling interventions, we never use role models that are celebrities or famous sporters or artists or whatever. Because of course, our target population generally, it might depend on your behavior, but generally they're not celebrities. So they know that whatever is true for, uh, for those, those celebrities, those models, will not be true for them. So it's super important that people identify with the model, also that the model actually is rewarded, receive, receives positive reinforcement for the behavior. It's important that they struggle with the behavior because that's also the experience of your target population. So because these um, um, evolved learning processes, processes didn't evolve so that we can use them, 
but they evolved because it kept organisms alive or um, made them more effective procreationally. Um, if we do want to use them, we really have to understand them well so that whatever we do mimics the situation for which those um, methods evolved in the first time. Then we got abstract concept learning. This evolved quite late, so as far as we know, only a few other organisms besides humans are able to do this. And basically this means that you can symbolically represent, represent other things. This is a requirement for language, for example. And finally, there's reflective learning. And that evolved as the last one, and as far as we know, only humans have this. So these evolved learning processes evolved over time. These are, as far as we know, how organisms, living organisms can learn. And learning is of course not only learning as we are sitting here now in an educational setting, it's not only declarative memory, it's not only just memorizing facts, it's basically any change in the human psyche. So that means any change in the human psyche, whether it's psychotherapy or whether it's designing a behavior change intervention, or doing some self-reflection and deciding to change your behavior yourself, whatever, all of these necessarily use one or more of these evolved learning processes. That means if you want to change human behavior, you will have to use these learning processes. But they're also super rudimentary. They're very simple in a way. So it's very hard to think about how to use these in actual interventions, how you would use these in a brochure or in a training manual for peer education interventions. But fortunately, in psychology, we have a lot of research on how to well, basically manipulate psychological constructs. They did experiments and they were like, oh, if you give this to these people and you give this to that people, those people, and this is the control condition, then this happens. Those things, those manipulations of psychological constructs that work, those things we can actually do to change constructs, therefore, inevitably, necessarily, use these evolved learning processes. They're just like building blocks at a lower level. So what we use is that we generally look at uh, methods for behavior change, such as planning coping responses, and those then use one or more evolved learning processes. And those planning coping responses, those, those methods, um, have a kind of definition, a kind of description of how you use it, almost like a manual. And they have the so-called uh, parameters of use, which are the conditions you need to satisfy for that method to actually be effective. I explained modeling earlier, if you want to use vicarious learning. With modeling we know that if your target population can't, ident can't identify with the model, it will not work or at best be much less effective than it can be. And this is where the psychology comes in, so you actually have to understand these methods. The intervention mapping book has tables with these methods and Finally, we, or finally, already a few years ago, we published an open access article that also has those. Which was of course important, of course, because we don't want access to this to only be available to richer NGOs. So now it's available to the world. Um, and we have 99 methods in those tables. So then the question is, which methods do you use? And there's of course also an answer to that, which we'll get into now. If you talk to people about why they do what they do, as psychologists, we usually try to avoid stuff with people. We use like questionnaires or reaction time tasks. But sometimes, apparently, it's useful to actually talk to real life people. If you talk to people and you ask, for example, why they want to use a high dose of uh, MDMA, then you'll get considerations like this. Like whether they actually like the effects that they get with a high dose. Or what they think their friends think, their friends think they should do. Or whether they are even able to obtain pills with a lower dose. Or if they use a high dose, it facilitates connecting to others more or less. Or whether they get more energy if they use a high dose. Or whether their friends use a high dose of MDMA. Or whether they're able to determine their dose accurately. For example, in some countries you can't actually get your XC tested, that makes it very hard. Also, some pills are hard to break, um, so it's also harder to dose properly. Whether they will still remember everything when they use a high dose. Um, whether if you use a high dose, you hallucinate more, which you do, <laughs> and whether they like to hallucinate. Because of course, each of those consequences doesn't have the same value, the same evaluation for everybody. 
some people actually like to hallucinate. I mean, then they use more psychoactive drugs, more hallucinogenic drugs. And of course, there are better choices, like LSD, but that, those trips last very long, so that's the choice. Or 2CB, which is less hallucinogenic. But not everybody can get to those drugs, because it depends on your dealers, maybe your friends. And then if you really like to hallucinate, maybe you take a lot of MDMA, which is suboptimal, but well, it might be all they have. So these are the things you need to understand. So actually the question is, how do you get from these reasons to these behavior change methods? And the answer is kind of in the, what we discussed earlier in psychological theory. Because these theories cluster together those reasons people have for behavior in constructs, in those more generic determinants, by basically clustering everything that is either similar or functionally similar together. So either stuff roughly looks the same, or stuff has the same role in people's psyche. And those uh, different determinants are then combined in a theory. For example, here is a super simple representation of the reasoned action approach, which used to be called the theory of planned behavior. And these uh, methods for behavior change are organized per determinant. And that's because, well, that's what Rick and me think at least. We still have to <laughs> find out whether that's true and write it up. But we think that the idea is that these uh, evolved learning processes correspond also to different types of memory. You saw that on the earlier slide as well. You have um, autobiographical memory, and that responds to the being able to reflect on your behavior and then learn through that. And you have declarative memory, which corresponds to the uh, symbolic representation. And because you learn in different ways, that is also manifested in your psychology, basically, in your psyche. And that's why to change different types of determinants, different types of psychological constructs, you have to use different methods for behavior change. And that's why they're organized by determinant. And that is why, even though in an intervention you always target subdeterminants, you target very specific expectations of people, that's why you still need to know what construct, what determinant they belong to. Because that's your link to which behavior change methods can work. If you know something is part of, for example, perceived norm, then you know that you need methods to change perceived norm. Because psychologists, when they study human psyche or changing human psyche, they generally study that at the level of gen general constructs. So if you go into the literature and you want to know how to change something, then you can't look for um, how to change people's expectation that if during the break from a lecture they go for a run for 15 minutes instead of smoking, for example, um, you won't find a lot of literature on which methods work to change that specific expectation. But if you know that there's a theory that says that this specific expectation can be considered part of attitude, and you understand this, then you can search for attitude, and then you will find a lot of literature on how to change attitude. So that's why you always need both the determinants and the subdeterminants, even though you don't find the determinants in your intervention, because you target the subdeterminants. Okay, well, these two slides go to illustrate that indeed the other determinants also have their own table. So basically, um, you have loads of determinants. As I said earlier, there was this joke that a self-respecting psychologist um, treats theories like a toothbrush. Nobody uses anybody else's. But we do have a lot of theories on behavior that sometimes basically explain the same stuff, just slicing reality up slightly differently. So you have a lot of these determinants. And you have a lot of subdeterminants that kind of belong to those. And your goal in step two is map this out as exhaustively as possible so that you understand why people do what they do. So, an intervention, if it is to work, it will inevitably need to contain these behavior change methods. Or not even contain the methods themselves, because those methods are described as kind of generic recipes, generic processes that can be implemented in many different ways. Take modeling, for example. The fact that you use a role model to kind of show a behavior and then the model is positively reinforced, etc. You can do that. I mean, peers who do peer education interventions can be considered role models because they are peers, so the audience can identify with them. Um, but you can also do this in a brochure by having a story there, or a comic, or a series game, or a video. Or So the way you implement these behavior change methods can look vastly different. The description describes a psychological process, not what it looks like tangibly in the intervention, if you know what I mean. 
So not only does this uh, intervention has to implement one or more behavior change methods, those also have to target um, determinants that are important for the target behavior, such as attitude, or sometimes risk perception, or perceived norms, or habits, or whatever. Or more specifically, they have to target the subdeterminants that are relevant for the target behavior that belong to those determinants. And then, if that all goes well, then at the right moment, the right signal will be sent by the motor cortex to the uh, muscles, and then the muscles move, or people say something like, no, I don't want an ecstasy pill because I just had an ecstasy pill and it was 110 milligrams, which is exactly the dose that I have to use to stay within the recommendations, so no. That's usually not how people say it in real life, but that would be nice if people would do that a lot. So, these methods of behavior change, as I said, are studied at a generic level. Psychologists, the psychologists who do lab studies, study methods to change norms, or methods to change attitude, or methods to change knowledge or habit. So these are always studied at this generic abstract level of the determinants, of the constructs. And in your intervention, you have to target sub-determinants. You have to go from the generic to the specific. And th you don't only do that with the parts of people's psyche you target, you also have to do this with the behavior change methods. So you have to translate them into what we call practical applications. Applications of the method. And the way you do this translation depends on a lot of things, such as these uh, parameters for use, so the conditions under which the method is effective. For example, the target audience has to identify with the model if you use role modeling. Characteristics of your target population. Culture, for example, which kind of falls under characteristics of target population. Um, the context of the intervention. Sometimes you know that you have a peer education intervention implemented already, so then it makes sense to you create an intervention that connects to this, that can be used in that settings. Sometimes you know that you have a population that's very hard to reach, but that is active online, for example. Then you would want to make something that they can access with a smartphone, for example. Sometimes you target uh, people in high school, so you can create an intervention that can be used in a school setting. So generally, the kind of practical, pragmatic constraints also shape how you translate your methods into applications. And even which methods you choose. Because some methods, for example, to change people's self-efficacy, so their perceived behavioral control, so the, the confidence they have they can do something successfully. If you want to change that, one of the methods that you can use is guided practice, where you basically practice the behavior with them, with guidance. Um, of course, you can only do that if you have a person there with them to do this, or if you can mimic it, mimic it in a serious game or something in VR. If you can only make brochures, you can't use guided practice. So you have a lot of these practical considerations that you take into account as you make these choices. And that's why modeling can look, for example, like a role play, a script for a role play that people use, or something on TV, like a little video. TV was what people used to use in the old days to watch like movies and series and stuff. Um, or you can make a, a billboard. It all depends on your, well, on all these practical factors that I mentioned earlier. So now we get to the last links of this causal structural chain. Subdeterminants are changed by applications, basically the parts of your intervention that people get. And these applications only work if they implement behavior change principles or behavior change methods. And they don't only, they, it's not enough that they implement them. In implementing them, they have to satisfy the parameters for use of those methods. They have to use them properly. Because if you don't satisfy those parameters of use, then the way your um, behavior change principles will arrive at your target population is not similar enough to why the evolved learning processes you want to use, the ones that underlie the behavior change principle, develop, evolved. Because again, if you help people learn, you know, even though we're trying to help them, the, the methods we use didn't evolve for us. They didn't evolve for behavior change interventions or for prevention. They evolved for very different reasons. So if you want it to work, you really have to make sure you do it just right. Otherwise, it won't work. Nobody ever said life would be easy. Okay, so we have these causal structural change. So to give an example, we want people to dose ecstasy within the recommendation. Then one behavior and this behavior, this sub-behavior, performance objective is kind of like uh, cheating, but it's used quite a lot in intervention mapping that people have to decide to do something. Because it can be a convenient place to put some determinants or some knowledge that 
is in generally relevant. But it's also a behavior that's not controlled by muscles, of course. It's just something cognitive. So this is a bit tricky, but we use it a lot. So, so they have to decide that they want to avoid a high dose in the first place. Then they, we know that attitude is an important predictor of this decision. And we know that one of the considerations people have is that they generally don't necessarily want time to uh, pass faster. We know we can uh, target this subdeterminant because it belongs to attitude with a method called persuasive communication. And because of reasons, we decide to implement that in an infographic. And in de designing this infographic, in implementing this behavior change method, it's important that the message is perceived as relevant by the target population. That's one of the parameters of use for persuasive communication. It seems kind of trivial, but you'd be surprised how often this goes wrong in real life. And of course, an intervention consists of multiple of those causal structural chains, because you generally want to target multiple sub-behaviors. As, yeah, well, multiple sub-behaviors and multiple sub-determinants. And if one of them um, it doesn't quite work, if it turns out you select a sub-determinant that actually doesn't matter for the target behavior in your population, then of course that whole chain is gone. So you have less effectiveness left. And the same thing goes for the behavior change uh, methods. If you use a behavior change method that isn't matched to the determinant you want to target, then it won't work. Or if you don't implement the uh, parameters of use properly, it also won't work. And if you target a sub-behavior that actually is not relevant for the target behavior, then it also won't work. And then, of course, often we do these determinant studies in groups of people. So we get a kind of ranking of subdeterminants and determinants that's based on the whole, well, on a sample from the population. But unfortunately, people have the audacity to be different. So that means that for any given individual, some of those causal structural chains won't actually be relevant for that person. So this is roughly what you're looking at. If you screw up some things and given the fact that people are different, you basically have way fewer of those causal structural chains that are maintained for a given individual than you design in your intervention. So that's why usually you want as many as possible. And that's why in step two it's so important to properly think about the selection of subdeterminants. Because on the other hand, you can't expose people to an intervention for eight hours, because they have like lives and stuff. So there's always some pressure there. You want to put as much in it as possible, but you also want people to completely get experienced the intervention. Okay, so to help people maintain an overview of all these things, we created uh, acyclic behavior change matrices. You can kind of forget the acyclic. It, it makes sense in terms of the meaning, but yeah, mostly I needed it to get the A so that we could get ABCD. And the idea is that you have the spreadsheet where every uh, column in the spreadsheet represents one of these links in the causal structural chain. So that means that this spreadsheet has a, well, a pretty, not completely complete, but a pretty full overview of all your assumptions as to why you think your intervention will work. So in the middle column, the one with the subdeterminants, it describes everything you intend to change, or at least target, um, as parts of people's psyche. And it has all the behavior change methods, and every row is self-containing, kind of. So you can look at all those calls of structural change and judge them, discuss them with each other as to whether they seem reasonable and stuff like that. And then you can take this matrix and you can create the, the ABCD itself, which looks roughly like this. These colors are because we found out over the years teaching intervention mapping that, and for you guys it will probably be a bit easier, but for a lot of practical um, partners we work with, like at NGOs or stuff, Distinguishing a behavior from a determinant can sometimes be quite hard. So we color coded them now to try to uh, help people with this. So the idea of an ABCD is that it just has these causal structural chains, but it collapses stuff when they're the same. Basically, this is the logic model of change. This is the logic model showing why you think your intervention will work. And all the way at the right, it starts or ends with the target behavior, this big umbrella description. So in this case, for example, following the ecstasy dosing recommendations. Then, one column to the left, one a bit to the left, we have the sub-behaviors. In this case, deciding to follow the dosing recommendations. But also, discuss your planned use, your planned dose with your group of friends before you go, so that you can look out for each other. 
And then we see the determinants that we think predict these sub-behaviors. So for the decision, we think that perceived norms and attitude are relevant. And for the discussing with your friends what you want to use, we think that only perceived behavioral control is relevant. This one, just for the, to be clear, is super simplified. In fact, these tend to become so large that it's hard to print them on A4 and still be able to read them. They're still useful. Um, and that's a good thing that they're large, because that means you want to target a lot of things. But just so you know, if whatever you create doesn't look like this, that's a good thing. It should be larger and look intimidating to people. So then, it shows the subdeterminants that you want to change. Since you selected those subdeterminants, they're then called change objectives in intervention mapping, because they're the objectives in your intervention. Um, and then it shows which behavior change principles you want to use to target each of those sub-behaviors, how you implement those in applications, and which parameters of use you take into account in that application. So this basically, well, as I said, shows a logic model of your assumption as to why the intervention will work. We created uh, an app, in case you don't use R, um, that's like a kind of SPSS, but better. Um, we created an app which is here. Basically, the ABC is a Academy of Behavior Change, basically a foundation we use to label some behavior change things. .eu, because it's Europe-wide, slash apps, because it's an app, and then slash ABCD, because it's about ABCDs. And then if you go there, you'll see roughly this. And then you can click the data tab at the left. And then you can either upload an Excel spreadsheet, or you can copy-paste the link for a Google Sheet. And if you use a Google Sheet, you basically just get the URL where you're at when you are at the Google Sheet. But you also have to make sure to change the sharing settings at the top right, so that it's actually viewable by anybody with the link. Because otherwise, of course, nobody can access the spreadsheet using that link. So then you take the spreadsheet, you copy-paste it into that box. The application then downloads all the contents from the spreadsheet. You can see it here shown at the bottom. And then you click Generate Plot. And then it generates a plot. We thought it was a very well-labeled button. Um, once you generate the plot, you can download it in four formats. If you want to edit it afterwards, you can download it in the so-called SVG format, Scalable Vector Graphics, which you can edit with programs like Adobe Illustrator or the free Inkscape. Um, you can ask Gil about it later if you want to use it, and then he can ask me what it was called. And then um, and that can be useful if you want to reorganize some things or emphasize some things and draw circles around them or whatever. There's also some specific documentation at URL, which you don't have to remember because you'll get the slides afterwards anyway. So the idea is to develop an intervention, like the thing at the bottom right corner. You start with finding out your determinants, creating cyber plots or whatever else, and then selecting those. Then you know the change objectives you want to target. You enter them into your matrices of change objectives. Then, based on the matrices of change objectives, you match those um, change objectives through their overarching determinants to the behavior change methods. And think about how you can uh, apply those behavior change methods in your intervention. Given characteristics of your target population and the context and how much money you have available and stuff like that. Then, based on this, you create the ABCD which you can then use to discuss it with, well, with stakeholders and other uh, relevant actors, but also with, for example, an advertising agency or a copywriter or coders or whoever creates your intervention, depending on the kind of intervention it is. And then, of course, in those discussions, you might want to change things because sometimes other people also have good ideas. And then eventually your ABCD should represent what you think about why the intervention works. So, in this process, you have to make a number of decisions. You have to think about which applications you want to combine. Um, sometimes, if you have like a billboard, you only have one component to your intervention. But sometimes, if you do something in schools, you might have three or four lesson plans or something. And in that case, you have to think about what you combine where. And those, of course, have advantages and disadvantages, because if you have multiple components, not everybody in your target population might be exposed to all of the components. So that's a risk. But you might sometimes have too much to put it in one component, etc. Then, if you have components, you have to think about the order. Sometimes it's important to increase people's self-efficacy before you give them information about consequences, for example. Um, if it involves some interactivity, you have to scope the review, think about which things are discussed and which aren't. 
And finally, you generally want the program to have a kind of identity, like a logo, a name, preferably an acronym, something like that. So you have to think about this as well. So these are the four decisions that you also take um, in step three and four. The components, the sequence, the scope, and the themes. And then basically you're done with step three and you can move on to step four. It's very important in step three at a number of points to check whether you really still have all your change objectives. Because it can be quite easy, especially when you work with other partners who produce the intervention, that they uh, forget some of those. So always keep checking whether your matrices of change objectives are still fully represented. And if you work with external organizations, it's important to realize that they are generally not trained in behavior change, which can be quite hard because they are professionals and they have a lot of expertise. So they generally will want to use this expertise to make a good product. And they are humans, so they tend to think they understand humans. So they tend to think that they have behavior change expertise. So those can be kind of difficult discussions, especially with advertising agencies. Because advertising agencies, one of their unique selling points, one of the reasons people go to them, is because of their supposed experience in changing behavior. But what they generally do is shift, subtly shift behavior from one coffee brand to another coffee brand. But they don't generally make people stop drinking coffee or make people start drinking coffee. And those kinds of behavior changes are very different and a lot harder. So that means in practice they kind of think they know how to do this, but they don't really. So those discussions can be quite hard because you do want to respect their expertise because they know a lot of stuff that we know nothing about as well. So this is kind of tricky, but exciting and challenging. Um, so just to put everything in context again, we start with the needs assessment because often when people come to us with a given problem, it turns out the situation is slightly different if you look at it. Then we look at why people do what they do. So we do the determinant analysis. Then we link these determinants to methods and applications so that we know why we expect these changes. We integrate everything into an intervention that's then developed. During the whole process, you anticipate on implementation and usually develop other interventions for the implementers and the maintainers, etc. And then at the end, you evaluate. And then ideally, if you can afford it, you start over. Because behavior change is super hard, so interventions will at best have a partial effect, and it just takes time to understand your target population and their context and why they do what they do. So ideally you keep iterating until you solved the problem and you made the world a bit of a better place. Okay, that was this lecture, so thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, then this is the, the moment. Are there any questions? No? Well, excellent. In that case, you're dismissed. Thank you.